Hey everybody, uh, let's start the next portion of our program. Very pleased to see everyone um, made it back from the basement and you found something to eat. Um, I'd like to introduce my friend, Kem Hunter. Uh, <clears throat> Kim and I like to do little secret missions together. Like uh, two days ago, we were at the University of Washington Law School presenting to first year students during a brown bag luncheon and just trying to influence them to choose uh, a career, perhaps defending uh, GIs and other people who need to know about the, the UCMJ. Um, so, without further ado, Kim? Okay. Okay, we have a great uh, panel today. Uh, we'll talk about civilian support for GI the resistance. Microphone, brother. Oh. We'll talk, we have a great panel today that will talk about civilian support for uh, GI resistance uh, during the Vietnam War. And I'm going to change the sequence a little bit because we, um, at the last uh, discussion, it's going to be of a movie called The FTA Show. Uh, and um, we have a three-minute trailer loaded up right here, and I'm not sure it's going to work because this is a little beyond my expertise. But it's a great way to start the event. It, it talks about one way that uh, that soldiers were supported uh, in um, uh, during the Vietnam War to uh, give them some entertainment to, to support their anti-war work in a very um, entertaining way. Uh, the FTA show was a um, basically a traveling uh, was a traveling anti-war road show that uh, Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland, and, and some other stars put together to demonstrate, um, uh, to serve as a counterpoint to the USO shows that were going on, like um, the Bob Hope shows and this sort of thing. Those shows tended to be um, patriotic, um, very patriotic. They tended to be uh, blatantly sexist and um, kind of racist, too. Uh, so this, these um, uh, tours, this tour serves as a counterbalance to all that sort of influence. To start off our panel today, I'll show you a short clip and then we'll go on to the panelists. I think. I don't know. Uh, 1971. As the Vietnam War rages, thousands of American soldiers rebel. A theater group led by Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland tours Asia and over 60,000 soldiers, sailors, and marines wildly cheer their anti-war message. I have a dream. I have a dream, big dream. Dream of democracy. That's my dream. And together, together we can help protect the free world. Watch one tango, help <laughs> One year later, the film of that tour opens in theaters. After only one week, it mysteriously disappears, never to be seen again until now. Perfect timing. We've just been figuring out what to do about the fact that there are apparently several thousand more GIs outside that can't come in, and so we're going to do a second show. Like you read the polls and you people want to see out of Vietnam, and you see the polls getting higher and higher every week, but yet we aren't out, you know, and how can you rationalize this? This man is doing nothing. He ain't really being no type of way. He ain't really about black people, know about families. So why should I shoot him? Mm -hmm. Mr. President, there's a terrible demonstration going on outside. Oh, there's always a demonstration going on outside, Pat. Yeah, but Richard, this one is completely out of control. They're storming the White House. Oh, in that case, I better call out the Third Marine. You can't, Richard. Why not? It is the Third Marine. Oh. <laughs> Right? What do we get? It's a farce, a one-man election. Look at 50,000 people died for a one-man election. The soldiers are expendable. Who cares if they die? Here they are, from the carrier, USS Enterprise, 4 f Phantom Jets in formation. Silver, glitting in the sunlight. They're up and over, down they come. There go the 20 millimeter cannons. There go the rocket pods. There go the anti-personnel fragmentation bombs that I count. 12, water buffalo down and kicking. Somewhere out there in the booties. And we need that. Seven volunteers to go out there and bring it back in. Sorry, Jack, there ain't no more volunteers. Anybody seen any volunteers? We can no longer remain silent about the atrocities and injustice being perpetrated by the United States military and peoples of other nations. Soldier, we love you. We will use the guns you force upon us. We will use them to defend our very lives 
and the menace to our lives does not lie on the other side of a no-man's land set apart without our consent. It lies within our own boundaries here. Who is Great way to start after lunch, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Elaine, Elaine Ellenson was uh, one of the people who helped promote this show and put it on during its Asia tour, where it toured uh, in a lot of uh, near the a lot of the major military bases that were staging areas for the Vietnam War. Uh, they even tried to get into Vietnam itself to show the war, but for some reason they were denied entry. I have no idea why. <laughs> Uh, she would have had a told, wonderful story to tell, but unfortunately she had a family medical problem. She can't be here. So she gave me some information, and for the last panelist, I will be her stand-in and tell her story. So now we'll go back to uh, the other panelists, uh, and we can uh, uh, just briefly myself. Uh, I served in Vietnam. Uh, I was raised in a military family and um, became uh, very... <laughs> Uh, anti-war uh, from my personal experience of what was going on over there. Uh, I switched careers when I came back was a career Seattle firefighter. Uh, went to law school right here at the University of Washington. Uh, retired uh, from that a few years ago. And now I'm a uh, board member on uh, Seattle chapter of uh, Veterans for Peace, uh, uh, co-sponsors of this uh, event, and a board member of Peace Streets Vietnam. So I would like to introduce uh, the first panelist, McGann Cornish. Uh, began will share her story about her involvement in the anti-war GI coffee house uh, movement. McGann grew up in a military family and joined the anti-war movement in college at the height of the Vietnam War. Moving to Washington State after college, she became a staff member uh, at Shelter Half, a GI coffee house near Fort Lewis, uh, Tacoma, uh, in, in Tacoma. After that, she continued work for feminists, socialists, and anti-war causes and is currently a writer and staff member of Freedom Socialist Newspaper. In 1974, she launched a career with Seattle City Light breaking glass ceilings by being one of the first women to break into the electrical utility trade uh, right here in Seattle, and the first to be promoted to power dispatcher, the highest ranking trade job um, of, uh, at City Light. Uh, so welcome, Megan Cornish. So when I started uh, preparing for this talk, I got more and more intimidated <laughs> about how to, how to express what went on. For one thing, the collective I was a part of didn't get to the shelter house until um, mid-1970. And there were a lot of really important events that happened before then. So luckily there's a really good Wikipedia entry, which I... <laughs> Uh, urge everybody to go read <laughs> on the GI Coffee House movement, and um, it helped me remind me of some of those facts that I was not a uh, participant in. Um, the movement was really important, and it was started by a vet, by the way, um, and they wrote raised money so that people could be full time staff members on, you know, subsistence money, but still. Uh, and the Shelter Half, I think, was one of the, like, maybe the third coffee house to be set up. And um, it was really important because it was the main staging area for sending people to Vietnam. And uh, it was set up in, in late 1968. And by early 69, there was a demonstration in Seattle uh, led by hundreds of GIs <laughs> and followed by, I don't know, a thousand maybe or so uh, civilians against the war. Um, so it, it started out, you know, being, being a force for, for supporting GIs. Um, even though really the movement was the GI movement, you know, and we were just doing what we could to give them a place to, to work out of. Um, by the uh, late in 69, there was an on, and I'm going to skip a lot of things, a lot of things never even got documented maybe, but by late 69 there was a, a big 
on base meeting uh, talking about setting up a union for GIs. Uh, and uh, I believe Andy Stapp, I don't know if he was here or whether he was just consulting with people. He was the person who was kind of the driving force uh, behind the American Servicemen's Union, uh, giving the idea that, hey, GIs are just workers. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't ha have a boss that can take away all their, you know, all their rights and run their lives. Um, and shortly thereafter, the military put out a notice that they were going to uh, try to get the shelter half put off limits <laughs> because things were, were being organized out of there. Um, and that kicked off an early uh, 1970 uh, event at the University of Washington a collaboration between anti-war students and GIs, the trial of the army, which got tremendous, tremendous coverage in the media. And there were some 50 GIs who testified about what was going on over there and how horrendous it was. Um, and magically, after that event, the army decided maybe they would drop the attempt to put shelter half off limits because it would have been toxic. <laughs> and that's one of the things I wanted to mention. I do think one important thing about the shelter half was a way of um, connecting the civilian anti-war movement with the GI movement, which was not that easy to do, you know, because people were coming from really different places and didn't necessarily have touch with each other that much. Um, I think the civilians got a lot more out of it than the GIs probably did. Uh, I know I certainly, <laughs> I certainly got a tremendous amount out of my, my time there. Um, and the, I was part of a uh, collective, a new left collective that pulled together in Ithaca, New York, uh, where, I, where I, I had graduated from Cornell. And uh, we came out uh, thinking we were going to join the Seattle Liberation Front, which had started the previous year. By the time we arrived, it had kind of collapsed. <laughs> and we were looking around for things to do. And the two remaining members of the shelter half Everybody else had, you know, been worn out by events, and uh, they were hanging on until they could get some people to, to take over for them. And here we were, a, a ready-made group, and uh, we formed the, uh, the core of the Shelter Half uh, staff from then on. Um, when I look back at my, at my time, a lot of it is a blur, frankly. Uh, I wasn't stoned all the time, honest. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I actually was surprised to find out when I was doing a little research that I had at one time saved one copy of Fed Up, the GI newspaper that we were working to help, to help put out. And I donated it to the UW, who knew? <laughs> um, but anyway, there was an FTA show at uh, Fort Lewis. Um, I actually didn't see it because it came and went so fast that I went on a you know two week visit to or three week visit to my mom and it would, we found out about it and it happened and it was gone by the, t by the time I got back. Um, but needless to say it was a big, big <coughs> huge event. <laughs> um, more importantly, well, maybe I shouldn't say more importantly because I'm sure it, it helped stoke the fires as well, but um, it was what the GIs were doing that, that really made the difference. Um, on McCord, some of the black uh, servicemen were uh, getting together with the Panthers, <laughs> and I think maybe they... Uh, 
undercover got some of them on base for a meeting. Um, and then there was the, the famous time that was talked about in, in the first uh, panel uh, where <laughs> 16 people got arrested for distributing <laughs> the Declaration of Independence. That was brilliant, Mike. <laughs> really brilliant. <laughs> And uh, uh, very, of course, very embarrassing to the military. We did what? <laughs> uh, and I had totally forgotten, but there was a con congressional committee that was formed to study subversion of the military, and they started looking at Fort Lewis. Looking back on it now, that may have something to do with uh, what happened to my relationship with my mother, uh, <laughs> who lived in the D.C. area and was a military widow. Um, but when I look back on, you know, the things that I was involved in day to day, it was like getting movies in on weekends, uh, you know, going to uh, meetings or setting up uh, spaces for meetings, the uh, uh, Pacific Counseling Service, the, there was a group that Mike was working with for a while, um, uh, helping to do leafleting. I, all of us got, of course, tossed off the base <laughs> and banned for life. And often could, would go back in by, via the back roads. I'm sure there are, this doesn't exist anymore, but back then, you know, the GIs knew the back ways to get in without going through a, <laughs> a guard. So um, I learned about how the CIA was pushing drugs in Vietnam, and it was several years later when that was actually documented. This was not you know, being made up. Um, we did a lot of trying to help guys decompress uh, from their events. A lot of them didn't talk about what happened over there, except very roundabout. Like, I heard a couple of guys saying, you would not believe the experimentation that's being done on GIs by the military. Um, and they, they didn't want to talk about the specifics, probably because they wouldn't be around very long. Um, by the summer, I think it was the seventh summer of '72. Yeah, the uh, the Fort Lewis was shut down as a processing center for sending GIs over. And at that point, the activity level fell off significantly. Um, around then, um, I started looking around for, gee, how can we put this all together? You know, there's all these people across the country and throughout the military who hate the war. Uh, we. I had been very influenced by the women's liberation movement. Uh, everyone that I knew was a strong supporter of the civil rights movement and the black power movement. I considered myself a supporter of the Black Panther Party in college. Uh, how to put it all together? And the gay rights movement was just pulling pulling itself together, coming into existence, how to put it all together. So I, I the, the route I uh, decided on was radical politics. Uh, I joined Seattle Radical Women and then the Freedom Socialist Party, which is why I'm on the staff of the newspaper. I'd love to sell anybody an issue <laughs> or a subscription later on. Um, but seriously, I, the things, the things I, I feel I learned were what someone else said, you can change history. Together we can change history. 
And the people who change it are the people on the bottom. Whether it was um, poor people in the South who started the Civil Rights Movement, whether it was the GIs who were certainly on the bottom, or they wouldn't have been being drafted. Um, and the, all the list of the other people who are on the bottom. And I think it's important for us to talk about what were, you know, there were the, the fascinating, the wonderful power that we showed at that time, but also its limitations because a few years later it was, it was all gone. And so how can we, and I know there's some people here who are working on bringing the, the news of what what we, among the thousands and hundreds of thousands, made happen then, how, how we can recreate that in this country. And the two things I see are, we need to realize it's capitalism. You can't just have a movement that gets rid of, you know, one part of it. <laughs> you just can't. And the other is, we don't all have to agree on every small thing, but we got to fight together. <laughs> we got to decide on, on, you know, some basics and fight together. If we're not out there fighting for black lives, I'm sorry, nothing's ever happening. You know, if we're not feminist, nothing is ever happening. If we're not fighting imperialism, our own and everybody else's, you know, nothing's nothing's changing. So anyway, I, I'll stop blithering on, but um, I do think this conference is very important. I I really thank Vets for Peace for pulling it together and and this, the exhibit. And you know, I know we're getting on, but there you know, there's all these new generations, and let's hook up with them and <laughs> keep doing what needs to be done. Thank you so much, McGinn. <clears throat> Our next panelist is Raleigh McElmore. Raleigh will share his experience while assigned to the Pacific Counseling Service. Created by anti-war activists during the Vietnam War, PCS provided free services to military personnel who opposed the war, including help in applying for conscientious objector status, dissemination of true information about the war, and assistance with disciplinary issues. After refusing induction orders in 1968, Raleigh joined PCS to assist military personnel at Fort Ord in Monterey, California. Starting with offices on the West Coast, PCS eventually expanded to a number of outposts near U.S. military bases throughout the Pacific. Raleigh, give a hand. It was a hell of a time. It was great. I, I was 18, and and all kinds of crap was happening all around me. And I, I, I wasn't a leader. I wasn't a mover or shaker. I was one of those people, like a dog. I just kind of, I'm in it. I'm in it to win it. Let's go. And and that was part of a culture, a contextual culture, that maybe doesn't exist right now. But it was a culture of anti-war songs, of, of counterculture. Of, it, was, it was great. And... Um, what came out of it, and I think maybe it, uh, the most important lesson for people now presently engaged in struggle, is that you have your own unique creative input in this. If you listen to us the whole time, I mean, some of the stuff, I mean, it's a whole different world with internet and everything else. So be careful, be careful not to get you know, swamped by it and think freely. This, here's an example. They have this little W sign. You know, I see it right there, right? It says, in white letters that you can't read. We won't work for war profiteers. Now a person has to come right up to your chest to read it, and when they do, you give them a leaflet. All right? That's your chance, talk to them. And that's what I was seeing. So I came in in 1968 refusing induction, and I defended myself in my trial. It was an incredible experience. And around me, 
uh, when I refused, 14 people refused, including a person who tried to get their watermelon inducted. I mean, it was a crazy time. We, it was wonderful. And um, I tore all my papers up and made origami cranes and handed them out while drill sergeant looked like he was going to explode, not knowing how to stop me. Um, don't, don't look for what's going to hold you back. Don't look for permission, okay? Um, it's going to be your world. Take it, okay? So... All right, 1968, 550,000 troops in Vietnam. Nixon wins. Nixon says, I'm taking them out. And he does. He takes 50,000 troops out, 150,000 troops out. Four years later, there's 50,000 troops in Vietnam. I worked at Fort Ord, which, like, like uh, the base here, is a basic and advanced infantry training place. Okay? And I went there because I was getting pretty good at understanding the law, and then I had to learn the UCMJ law about conscientious objector status. I went there to serve, and, and, and then I found all my horizons expanded as we realized it was more than just you filing a CO. We were going to stop the war. It was more than just doing that. And, and so not only do you hand them a leaflet when a person comes up to you and you're at the Greyhound bus station, and they say, yeah, I just got out of basic training, man. That was crazy. They're telling us to do some crazy stuff. I say, you do not have to do this. You, you have to think for yourself. Don't let them do this. Don't railroad. Don't get railroaded. And they'd say, yeah, you know, I want to talk more about CO. And over time at Pacific Counseling Service, we went from, uh, there isn't a paper for filing CO. You have, to write a, you have to write a paper and give it to your commanding officer who hates you for doing it and says, I'm a CO. And... We move beyond the idea of how to counsel to saying, you know, if you're going to win, even CO, or you're going to have to really try and fight to stop the war. And you're going to have to tell your friends, because your friends are the one thing that's going to protect you in this application. And you have to, and we began to expand how we, how we counseled to say, you need to fit into this broader picture of stopping the war. And you, and you need friends, and to do that you need to talk, and not every CO wanted to talk. Some of them were embarrassed. They were scared. It's like, Christ, am I the only person that's a chicken? You are not chicken, and there's at least a bunch of people there that would love to hear you say that. And when they hear you, they will come to you. And you need to give them a leaflet, and we need to expand, and that's your protection. And that's, if, even if it's just a CEO you want, that's going to help you. When they say, and they did, you went to your company commander, I'm going to file for CEO. When you did that, the company commander would say, there's a plane leaving for Vietnam from the Overseas Replacement Center in Oakland tomorrow. Oh, well, I'll take my paper back. No, you have to have strength in the fellows and the people around you. Okay, um, please, uh, okay. Um, it, uh, what, what happened was, by, 19, six, by the middle of 68, we were passing out leaflets uh, about Spring Mobilization Committee March and April of 68. We began to run into all these people with... Uh, Buzz cuts, some looking for topless joints, but others wandering around saying, where do I get some, where do I get some dope? Or, what's going on? And, and we, began to, we began to say, some of these people are actually looking pretty grizzled. They were AWOL. In 1971, almost 18% of the entire United States Army went AWOL. That's 180,000 people who did not return to the base. That is a lot of people. The country, and we began to realize as peace activists in the civilian side, they're losing their grip. <laughs> they don't got, they don't act, they, this is not a slam dunk for them. And then I began to think of them, at the time, I began to think of us, these are draft resistors in uniform, let's go after them. <laughs> and so we started hitting the Greyhound bus station. We started going to topless joints. We started going to bars. We mopped down Market Street. We, we started going places where GIs were, and we, and we, got all fired up because people started saying, yeah, yeah. And we learned that when that GI says, yeah, you know, I just finished advanced infantry training. I think I'm going to be ordered to Vietnam. You know, I, I, I'd, like to, you know, I'd like to read that. They say, no, no, no. Take a few. Take a few. Get it into the barracks. Take a few. You know, you know and, and, and we expanded out in our actions and stuff. And it was very successful. And as a result, PCS, Pacific Counseling Service, uh, formed its first office in Monterey, which I, I helped, I joined in that effort in 1969 after my trial was over. I went to, I went to uh, Monterey. We took over a 
relatively subdued draft counseling office and created West Coast Counseling Service, which became Pacific Counseling Service. The, the country, Nixon was, was removing grunts from the ground in Vietnam. The air war was expanding. CO applications in the Air Force and the Navy were skyrocketing. The war wasn't being stopped. The war was shifting. And what was genocidal with foot soldiers with M16s is far worse when you use cluster bombs. And so our, and the Pacific Counseling Service, we were completely wired up. And on a budget of $60,000, we opened up 11 offices, including all along the Pacific Rim. We opened up offices in Japan at the place where the naval base was, but also a lot of rest and recreation, so we could get GIs who were coming from Vietnam for R&R. &R. We opened them up in Okinawa, where B-52s were lining up to drop incredible tonnage of bombs on the Vietnamese. We opened them up in the Philippines, the Clark Air Force Base, where no B-52s dropped bombs on the Vietnamese until the American airmen came out and said to the PCS office, hey, they're dropping bombs on Vietnam. It is against American treaties in the Philippines to conduct a war from the Philippines. It was four American soldiers who were then, PCS set up the press conference, that night they were arrested for espionage. You know, that's not bad, it worked. We got press everywhere. They arrested these guys before they could talk. It, they keep picking up rocks and dropping them on their own feet. You know, and it's like, and so from that press, we got enormous publicity and a, a, a senator named Aquino came forward and said, I want these people in the press. I want them in the press. And they developed a hearing and Aquino then made the Philippine Times Dispatch say, we're beginning to worry that we don't know if we can trust what Marco says. It's the kind of influence that this kind of work can do. And it, 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 you can't, I think Randy said, it, you can't always expect it. And you don't know necessarily when you're winning, you know? And, and you, you have to get past that. You have to know you're doing the right thing. As a result of this, Marcos declared martial law. <laughs> Not just this, but as a result of all the work the Filipinos were doing, martial law was declared. Our PSS, PCS offices were shut down, and they threatened to kill them all. They threatened to kill our... our but uh, we had... We had it's a, you play the piano on both hands. And, and so some um, uh, politicians, politicians came forward, and we got our people out. Many, many Filipinos that we don't know did not get out. But we kept these offices open on a shoestring, and they were successful. If you get to see the FTA show, you'll see a huge number of uh, Okinawan... Uh... Yeah, a few more hands. Yeah, about three. Okay, uh, I'm looking at the clock now. Okay, uh, okay, let me go on before I forget everything. Um, first, we realized, hey, these guys, they might stop the war. I refused induction. That was kind of the end of it. I, I had to be an activist. But these guys are there. They need this to work. They need the machine. The machine's breaking down. They're losing their grip. Let's work on it. Let's let's just keep let's keep pulling their fingers loose on this thing, you know. And so, um, when we got to Fort Ord, one of the things I saw as a civilian was at night uh, at the end of advanced infantry training, <coughs> the sky would light up in the south with uh, um, flares. There'd be bright flashes from live fire exercise at the end of a a advanced infantry training. And those of us who were counselors, it began to dawn on us, this is the real deal. You know, these people are going to die and kill unless we stop them, unless we get into it. Um, the drawdown continued. More and more GIs came back. Uh, our staff increased all around. Uh, we kept nine offices open until 1975. Um, and what happened in Monterey was a little bit like what, what you guys were talking about. We had a group called Movement for Democratic Military. It was far more overtly radical than we were, although we were all supporting the Panthers. We were all, you know, you, you just couldn't, you wouldn't be caught dead without your Huey Newton button. But they, they, there were differences. When someone said, um, uh, I, I'm opposed to the war, I'm not sure if I should go. Well, maybe you should stay in. PCS did not say that. At least we didn't. PCS said, these are your options, and that's one of them, you know. And then when you decided CO, then we would help you with your CO. Um, and MDM said, stay in, raise hell. By 1969, I got a call at the, at the counseling office 
somebody's just super agitated. They're burning down the base. <laughs> they're, they're burning four doors? Is he, yeah, it's burning right now. Go out and look. And, look out, and there's smoke coming out of four doors. I said, oh, Christ, they're burning. We were so far behind the possibilities of what the soldiers were doing. Mostly people of color, black GIs, had been put in a place called Special Processing Detachment. Special Processing Detachment was a special area for what later I found the Criminal Investigation Division's separate adjunct called the Criminal Investigation Analysis Division discovered black GIs forced into a corner disobeyed. White GIs made newspapers, they fought against the war, they passed out leaflets, and there was, I had never thought of it that way, and I'm not saying that that's absolutely the correct analysis, but in this case, mostly black GIs had burned down their, their damn barracks. And, and we started doing a lot more stuff on base. Okay, to do it, you have to, get, you have to get to people, and you have to be creative. And so you look for places where they're weak, the people you're working against. And you, you get in, and you weasel your way in, and you, you get your leaflets onto the base by having GIs say, well, you know, you don't want to file CNO, but CO right now, but will you take these and put them in the PX? Will you put these in a phone booth? Uh, take them in your barracks, lay them around, and then run like hell. Uh, we, we don't care. Just, just get it out. Get it out. And, and when you file CO, tell people and, and explain it to them so they can understand. And these kind of things were what we built uh, and joined together with, like, Shelter Half and others. With the MDM Coffee House, um, it was a much more radical place. Um, and... We still, on Thursdays and other days, we would come in to do counseling, and it was finding places to work together, um, and finding ways to be strong when uh, you, you sometimes feel weak, when looking at 40,000 soldiers with M16s, okay? Um, we did summary assistance, like uh, uh, summary special and general court marshals. One of the things that black GIs faced with was because of dapping, yeah, what you were saying, dapping? They'd, they'd get an Article 15. They're just constantly, constantly being harassed for being themselves. And then for, for we, the military law office, started from National Lawyers Guild, began to provide, you aren't going to get away with having a single officer evaluate you unless we put a damn lawyer next to him. So look for opportunities. <coughs> They're wrong. They're weak. You know, they don't forget it. They, they look big and strong, and they sit behind desks, but don't be frightened, okay? Uh, and yeah, there, there is a price, but there's a price for them, too. And we saw this happen. The reason those GIs were coming back is because they couldn't win them with them. They, and they didn't want to be the last one to die, and they came back. Um, I'm sorry, I got one minute, I think. There's 60 seconds, large grub. Big thing was going to, I, I don't have time to read all this. Uh, I say. <laughs> Oh, okay, for the, for the people who are active in these struggles, um, don't try and out-military the military. They're good at it. It's not where you want to end up, okay? <laughs> Stand for something way better, and don't forget that you're standing for it, and don't try and weasel around on issues. You know, you can, tactics, fine. Issues, be honest. Treat people as intelligent, possible allies, and not as GIs in uniform. They're our brothers and sisters. If we're doing this, you have to believe that. Okay? Um, they're not props. Uh, the, 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 any group you're working with, the people you're working with, students, GIs, they aren't props. They're people. Treat them that way, okay? Uh, be creative. Don't do what we're talking about, okay? <laughs> do what you know is a better way of doing it, okay? Uh, and when opportunities come, don't be afraid to seize them and don't be afraid to take a chance. And don't be afraid to, you know, if you want to apologize later, you can. Uh, um, that's it. I'll use up to so Thank you. You know, you have to admire the enthusiasm of all our panelists. It is a very important subject that so few people really know that much about. So as a moderator, hey, I just can't rein them in. I just go. <laughs> no. Anyway, our, our final panelists, and whatever time we have remaining, we'll have time for Q&A, and I will uh, make a few more comments about the FTA show. Our final panelist is Barbara Dudley. She will share her experience at the start of the, her legal career defending GIs and court-martials in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Working with the National Lawyers Guild Military Law Office, she was assigned to outposts in the Philippines and Vietnam, and after that she devoted her career to a life of public service. 
Among other accomplishments, she served as an attorney for the California Legal Assistance and Agricultural Labor Relations Board, president and executive director of the National Lawyers Guild, director of a Unitarian Universalist Associate Foundation, executive director of Greenpeace USA, and, uh, well, I could go on, <laughs> but her, she's got a long resume, let's put it that way. And she now lives in Portland. Uh, a little side note, a little personal note. We got to check the notes, and it turns out that Barbara and I went to Stanford University exactly the same years, 1963 and to 1967. We didn't know each other then. Uh, she was an anti-war activist those four years, as I, and I was an ROTC student. <laughs> How about that? And it's so great to come together today uh, with a common goal. <laughs> One way we might have come together is I, I did take pistol and rifle marksmanship <laughs> through the ROTC uh, office at, at Stanford. That was one of my phys ed classes, <laughs> just saying. Um, so I, I graduated from law school in, uh, at, from Berkeley, in, which says a lot, uh, in June of 1971. I took the bar exam that summer. and headed to the Philippines um, with the military, the National Lawyers Guild's military law project by August of, of that year. Um, the National Lawyers Guild, for those of you who don't know, is a left-wing bar association. It was formed in 1937 because the ABA, one, was segregated, did not admit black lawyers, and because the ABA was opposing all New Deal policies. So the Lawyers Guild, um, was basically founded by a bunch of union lawyers, liberal New Dealers, and communists. Um, and uh, it was the first integrated bar association. It played a very key role in the New Deal era. It also played a key role in the McCarthy era, de defending leftists who were being blacklisted and, and um, prosecuted for various things. Um, it was key in the South during the Civil Rights Movement. I joined the Guild when I started law school. Um, as did a number of people of my generation, um, because we there was there were new movements afoot, and we knew about their their action, their their involvement in the civil rights movement. Many of us had also been involved with that, and they were also key in helping with the anti-war work in the states. So, doing uh, representing draft resistors, doing CO counseling doing support for people who were involved in anti-war demonstrations. But it was clear by 1971 that there needed a lot more. Um, and we realized that the GI movement was needing lawyers, and it was needing lawyers overseas. Because most of the trials by 1970 that were happening were, were happening out of sight of the US uh, press and public because they did not want the press or the public to understand the level of resistance that you've been hearing about now. Um, so the trials were happening um, in the Philippines at Subic Bay and Clark Air Force Base, and in Japan and in Okinawa, and at Long Bin in, in uh, Vietnam. Um, military law says that you have a right to a, a civilian defense attorney if one is available. So we decided to make ourselves available. So um, we, four of us, uh, there was a decision made at the, at the convention in 1971, and uh, four of us uh, headed to Southeast Asia. Two of us ended up in Olongapo, which is the base town outside of Subic Bay, myself and, and my colleague Dan Siegel. And then um, two others went to Japan and, and also covered Okinawa. Um, we, Alangapo, for those of you who have never been there, was kind of a rough place at the time. And it was post-Tet, so no military wives or, or families were allowed. So the, uh, all the GIs were on base. And the Navy kind of figured out who we were. I mean, we, we <laughs> they, they saw us coming. Uh, they, they wouldn't let us set up an office in Vietnam. I mean, the Lawyers Guild had a reputation from back with J. Edgar Hoover, and they were not letting us set up an office in Vietnam. When we got to the Philippines, um, they did not stop us, 
but they also did not let us just wander around freely. So we, we could only access the law library and the, and the brig um, and the courtrooms on the base. So we lived in Alangapo, and our house became sort of an informal GI center. The uh, PCS, the Pacific Counseling Service organizers who were there were out at Clark Air Force Base. They would come sometimes to, to be with us in Alangapo, um, but for the most part, we were just uh, there, and we were sort of, we became very well known to the GIs. It, the information passed very quickly. We did a lot of AWOL cases, um, including some, Randy told a story, I think today, about um, the, the soldier from Senegal who, who just kind of left the French army and went off with his girlfriend. Well, there were a number of GIs who did the same in the Philippines, and we just kind of wander off, and then they'd wander back, and, you know, and so we, we represented several of them um, and, you know, said, well, they're not AWOL if they come back voluntarily, right? I mean, so anyhow, it's always very entertaining. But um, we had far more serious cases as well. Um, we had one case of some GI soap sailors who had sold um, weapons from the naval magazine to the New People's Army, uh, which was the guerrilla movement at the time in the Philippines. Um, and so that was a little tense. Um, and I, I, I just want to tell you one of, it, from the Philippines, one of the most heartbreaking cases that I did, but that was somewhat indicative of what was going on over there, was a, a young 17-year-old, very soft-spoken, black marine who um, had been, had, had come to Subic on r and &R. He'd been on the ground in Vietnam and woke up one morning in, or in the middle of the night actually in the barracks, pulled his gun out from under his pillow and started shooting mm -hmm. and ended up wounding several GIs and killing two mm -hmm. that were just bunkmates, you know. I mean, he had, there was no malice of forethought. That it was just a spontaneous thing that happened. And um, it took me the longest time to even get permission to go see him in the brig because they were very sexist. I mean, it was tricky being a 25-year-old woman trying to be in military courts in Southeast Asia. Um, and so um, they were not going to let me into the brig because they kept saying, he's too dangerous, he's too dangerous. And I finally got in to see him. And the kid, I mean, he was heartbreakingly destroyed. I mean, he, he wept when, when I came in to talk to him. And I just, I, <laughs> yeah. um, so he, the story he told me was that he had had constant nightmares from a firefight he'd been in in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. God, I'm sorry. PTSD. <laughs> um, and he, he had shot a woman in, in the face and he couldn't get it out of his mind. And so he was always reliving that experience, and that's what had happened to him. Well, they were going to charge him with murder. So um, I did what we did in a lot of our harder cases, which is to bring in the press. Um, and luckily, I had a friend from Stanford who was a school stringer with the New York Times, and another who was a cameraman from uh, with CBS, um, and got in touch with them. And I also contacted Robert was his name, Robert's uh, pastor in Kansas, and his mother, and I brought them both to the Philippines. And I, um, we succeeded in having the murder charges dropped, but he was sent back to Leavenworth to um, where for, they had a segment of the prison there for the mentally, criminally insane, um, but he was not convicted, and we had lawyers ready to be there with him on when he got back to Leavenworth. But that was the kind of human we were seeing. There were so many young men. I mean, I was only 25, but I felt like their mother. You know, there were kids there, 17-year-old kids, who were horrified at being in the war. Coming off of Subic Bay into the town of Longapo, there was like a moat, right? Subic Bay was on a kind of island. And there was a moat that had a, a crocodile in it. And 
these guys would be selling, I don't know if for any of you have ever been in the Philippines, there's a thing, balut, balut, where they're selling uh, newly hatched little uh, ducklings that you eat, <laughs> if you're so inclined, um, or, or you throw them to the crocodile. And I had so many ducklings in my back, uh, uh, we had this like patio in the back because these GIs would buy them and bring them to me to take care of because they didn't want to kill one more thing. I would be giving them away to the neighbors all the time. I had a herd of ducks or whatever you call it, a gaggle. That's a duck. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I didn't ever get to see, oh, well, let me tell you, but because the press conference that Raleigh was talking about with Benigno Aquino, I don't know if that's a name you all remember, but maybe you remember Corey Aquino, his wife. Benigno Aquino was killed by Marcos um, not that long thereafter. I think it was 87 or 86, something like that. Um, and uh, he, But he was a senator in the opposition in the Philippines, and he helped engineer this press conference where the GIs were talking about um, uh, the fact that they were, in fact, doing air raids from uh, aircraft carriers that were leaving from Subic Bay, also directly from Clark Air Force Base, which was completely contrary to a treaty we had signed with the Philippines in 1959. And the whole thing of having U.S. bases in the Philippines was tricky enough. I mean, that was, that was a very uncomfortable situation because the opposition wanted them gone. Um, Marcos was busy becoming a dictator and wanted um, to maintain relations with the U.S., which was perfectly happy to have a dictator in charge. And so um, he, he was not pleased with the press conference where the GIs went and the sailors testified about the bombing raids going off at the aircraft carriers that were in, from Subic. And we had airmen who testified also from Clark about the direct raids. Um, they did get charged with espionage, and um, <laughs> that's where you left the story, but that, of course, is where the lawyers come in. So, I mean, that, that was a perfect example of why it's very handy to have lawyers available when you need them. Um, I, I did not ever see the FTA show because when it came to Olongapo, I was in Vietnam. Um, there was a case there, um, the guys, <laughs> with the Lawyers Guild um, couldn't get visas, but the FBI apparently didn't think women were a problem, so um, I could get a visa to get in, so I was the one who got to go to, to Vietnam. And the case that I handled there um, was 13 black GIs who were charged with mutiny. And I want to stress yet again, <laughs> other people have said it, but it needs to really sink in, particularly given how white this crowd is that the black GIs were treated so differently from the white GIs. When they refused to go out on patrol, they were charged with mutiny. The, the situation that happened there was that um, they were out at a fire base. There was a group of black GIs who had some affiliation with the Black Panthers. There were a, a number, I mean, a lot of the black GIs I represented and, and met and talked to um, were Black Liberation Front or, or Black Panthers, and there wasn't like some formal, you know, you have a membership card in your pocket or anything like that. It was how they identified. Yeah. Um, and they had, they had been refused permission to go to a memorial service for, it's a long story, but for um, the four black girls that were killed in the church bombing back in the States, they had just uncovered new evidence, and so there was a service in Cameron Bay that <laughs> black GIs were putting on. These guys were refused permission to go. So they got pissed and they refused to go out on patrol because, of course, their CO sent just them out on patrol, not the white GIs. So they went into their bunker and just said, no, we're not going. Someone threw a stun grenade into the bunker. They come roaring out with their rifles. Nobody got hurt. Nobody shot the rifle. The only injury in the whole thing was one of the black GIs in the bunker ended up deaf from the, from the stun grenade. But they charged them with mutiny. And I swear, if, if we had not had a lawyer there, that's what would have happened. That's how it would have ended up. But again, we got the press involved. And thinking about the involvement of the press is really central here, because remember how 
The press was so key in the, in the visuals of the Vietnam War. The press was also our lifeline to get information about what was happening to the GIs out into the American public. That was the way we could do it, and that's how we got these cases dismissed for the most part. Twelve of the thirteen we got out with less than honorable discharges, which was not the best thing in the world, but better than what they were looking at. One did time, um, Brother Raven, who was the head, the kind of honcho of the group, who came to visit me later in Salinas when he got out of Leavenworth. He came to visit me when I was working with the farm workers in Salinas, California. Um, but um, it, it essentially made it possible for um, people in the states to understand what was going on racially within the, within the um, troops in Vietnam. Because there was such a division in how people were treated. There was also racism amongst the troops, but mostly it was the difference in how the brass treated uh, black GIs, I, like my Robert Gray, who was charged with murder for you know having a mental breakdown. That would not have happened had he been white. It would not have happened. And we were just seeing that time after time after time. So that's a really, really important piece of this to remember. Um, and I want to say one more thing about the, the press, because it's important to remember that they took the press and put them in a box in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. They were not covering the war freely. They were not talking to soldiers freely. We, we, have to, we have to see that they learned that lesson, and we have to figure out a way around it. Yeah. Because it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw that firsthand over and over and over again. Um, I think I'll probably stop there. I have uh, one amusing thing. I have no photos um, and no diary from my time in Vietnam because both my film and my diary were conf uh, confiscated when I left. Um, but I saw my letters later and part of my diary and the FBI files. I was going to say, ask the FBI. Through that, when, when the, and the Lawyers Guild sued be, trying to stop the, the FBI from, or the Attorney General from maintaining this um, subversive organizations list, um, we got boxes and boxes of discovery. And at that time, I was in the guild. I was the executive director of the guild in New York. And in those boxes were some files from the military law office. And there were letters. There were letters to my mother. <laughs> I mean, it, it was obscene. But they had everything that we, we had done um, from there. So um, people were talking last night about consequences. And you know, I think being a white lawyer, you get away with a hell of a lot, right? So even with an FBI file that won't quit, you know, I, I still live the life I live. But it's not so easy if you're working class, and it's not so easy if you're black. Right. Because you can't, I mean, you, you just can't get past the hurdle that's put in front of you if you have a, a bad um, security uh, situation or FBI file or, or a conviction or a bad discharge. Mm -hmm. All of those things can make a huge difference depending on your class and race. So that's, yep. that's a really, really key thing for us to keep in mind as we talk about the GI resistance. But um, it did work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll end with that. Thank you, Barbara. So I'll uh, explain a few, uh, share a few thoughts on uh, Elaine Ellenson's behalf, and then we'll get on to some Q&A. Uh, Elaine uh, wanted to be, uh, you all to know a couple things about the FTA show. Uh, first of all, its scope and breadth. Um, it played uh, outside major military bases all over the U.S. Uh, it was, um, uh, and uh, then when they went to uh, overseas and they performed in Hawaii, that was overseas, Hawaii, um, Philippines, um, uh, Okinawa, I on this one. Why Philippines, Okinawa, and somewhere else too. And they also played right here, Fort, Fort Lewis. And um, they, um, everywhere they went, uh, they got resistance uh, from the U.S. government. Uh, they did a pro forma request to uh, perform on base uh, at the big auditorium like all the other USOs did, uh, so we can entertain the troops with all these Hollywood stars. Uh, nobody ever took the deal. <laughs> nobody ever let them in. Uh, 
Um, in fact, the military took active uh, efforts to try to keep the soldiers and sailors from attending. Uh, they interfered with their, uh, um, with their efforts to uh, promote the show, didn't allow any distribution of the literature on, can on the uh, bases. They, um, they sometimes declared, the base commanders declared the show off limits. Base commanders can uh, have that kind of power. It failed. Uh, the soldiers and sailors went anyway, and there were so many of them that went that uh, the military couldn't do anything about it. Uh, one time, for example, in um, uh, Okinawa, the, um, the uh, base commander actually, re um, they were having an evening show, and they, remind they um, he ordered all the military uniform personnel to report to base, and they would be confined to base at the same time the show was going to be put on. Well, what they didn't know was is that these, this show had a lot of support from folks um, in the countries that they were invi invited to, and uh, the, uh, the, the people in the country knew how to play the, the game, knew what the alternatives were, so they very quickly arranged an alternate venue in the afternoon uh, and put the word out somehow, and they packed the house. Uh, th that's the kind of cooperation they did. Even getting uh, into the country was problematic. Uh, the, the whole group uh, landed at the airport in Japan. They'd already been cleared uh, to, for entry, and the government, Japanese government knew what kind of production they were. But when they were arrived at the airport, they were told, I'm sorry, that the visa you have is not the right visa for you to come into the country. Uh, and uh, so we can't let you in. And uh, so what they did is they immediately staged um, a, a, a press conference. The next thing you know, a bunch of news media shows up, and here's Jane Fonda and Don Sutherland and all these stars, and there's lots of hubbub. The, uh, their, their foreigner, their um, immigration office was making a panicked number of phone calls, and uh, they very quickly changed their mind to avoid a media relations disaster. But they, they ran into this sort of problem everywhere they went. They had a tremendously good rapport with uh, the people in the countries everywhere they went during the foreign tour. She was on the foreign tour uh, primarily. She was that's um, that's where she was primarily involved. Um, they met everywhere they went with uh, people who were also anti-war and full support of uh, their efforts. Uh, they um, a lot of them were really involved in um, post-colonial um, opposition to imperialist. Uh, uh, in, in imperialist um, control of their countries, and of course America had a lot to do with that, so uh, they had a lot of discussions. They also met with uh, folks who were, you would, might not think of, who were sort of collateral victims of uh, what we were doing over there. Every base over there uh, had a huge um, sex trade outside the bases. Uh, a lot of these women, that was the only way they could make enough money to feed the baby and this kind of thing. And there was so much sexual exploitation. They met with the people in this, um, in these, uh, uh, um, uh, who were in these circumstances, and they talked to some of the soldiers who definitely recognized that was a problem, and uh, put, put that problem in the spotlight, at least for a while. So they did so many other things in, in addition to entertaining the troops. It's just really, um, you know, just really amazing what they did. Uh, let me see if I missed any other points here. There's one interesting story about this that has never been answered. Um, when the, uh, they, they put the show on uh, in America, they went on the traveling road show in Asia, performed in a lot of places, uh, despite all the efforts of uh, the government to keep them, uh, the show from happening. And then during the foreign part of the show, that's when they made the movie, the FTA movie that you saw the little film trailer for. Uh, they, um, it, was a, it was a slick movie. I've seen it. If you've never seen it, I recommend you, you look at it. It cost them quite a bit of money to do. It was a pretty darn good production. Uh, then they, so the reason they did that is because the people who were putting on the show wanted the American people to see what they were doing. And if they made a movie of it, it would have a much wider audience. Well, um, the American government probably had different ideas. They would just assume not, that not anybody see that. So the weird thing happened. A week after it hit the movie theaters, it was suddenly pulled from the movie theaters and almost every copy of the film somehow disappeared. And nobody has figured out why. There are theories. Uh, some people have said uh, that the film distribution com uh, company, and they distributed lots and lots of films, the Pentagon had gotten to them and said, if you distribute that movie, you will never distribute any of your films in any of our bases anywhere in the world again. 
And that was a big, big contract. That's a theory. We don't know. Uh, somebody else thought that the pressure came all the way from the White House. It was a Richard Nixon at White House, 1972. And you can only imagine what sort of dirty tricks that might have involved. We don't know. Uh, the story has never been, nobody's ever gotten to the bottom of the story. I think the people who really have the inside uh, uh, information are no longer with us. But I'd be mean, very interested in knowing myself what happened. Anyway, um, somebody from the Sir No Sir movie wanted to show some uh, parts of that film in their movie. Came along, what, 85, 87, something like that. Randy's in that movie. <laughs> and uh, uh, they wanted to show part of the film script. So enough time had passed that they were able to get the film released again. Not all the copies were destroyed, so now it's still available uh, to show. So um, that's basically what I have. And I just wanted to point out that um, the civilian support for military people was just so critical in so many ways. Uh, and it was given uh, just because of a commitment and a belief that um, what the soldiers were doing was who objected to the war and wanted to fight, speak out against it or refuse orders was morally the right thing to do. And they, they risk, they, they devoted so much of their personal time and, and often risked their personal safety and lives to do what they were doing. So when people talk about, you know, uh, people thank me for my service to my country. Thank you for your service to our country. <laughs> Uh, we got a little time for Q&A, and, uh, 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 and uh, also if you want to ask it, I, I got a couple of things. Uh, um, let's see, Bob Barnes, uh, did you have an anecdote you wanted to share at this time? Uh, the anecdote would be predicated by a story that didn't get told, so I would okay. have to tell the whole story, so let's not do that. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I so, really um, tell the story. Okay. So yeah, he wants to tell a story though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's have some Q and A, and if we have time, you might ask, ask, ask offer a few closing thoughts, and uh, we'll hear more about the order of Maximilian. Now that I've got you, I've got you all curious about that. Yes. Yeah, I think one of the important points that, uh, you mentioned is the lack of access, present access to our recent foreign uh, entanglements, and uh, it's not a very thought of my part. But, the only thing the United States Army and military learned from Vietnam was to keep the press out of the war. Yeah. So any, any further comments that you want to make, I appreciate it. Yeah. See, hey, he's asking for other comments. I mean, I, I, would, I would just remark that there were fraggings in Iraq, there were fraggings in Afghanistan, but we hear nothing, almost nothing about that. There were, you know, Military yeah. is a very unsafe place to be, just generally. Military accidents happen all the time. There's no record of that. Uh, people shooting each other accidentally, that happens all the time. So, uh, and the press had to be embedded yeah. if they were going to cover anything in Iraq, and I assume the same is true in Afghanistan. Um, and embedded means watched, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't be going. I mean, you all remember the news clips from, from Vietnam. There was some pretty startling stuff going on, and they also had... Uh, easy access to talking to GIs on the ground in Vietnam. And that was not happening in Iraq, trust me, not at all. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, it makes a huge difference because the American public was starting to hear from their children who were over in Vietnam, you know, how horrific it was and how much they didn't want to be there. Yeah. Well, I'd just say, you know, the importance of supporting the independent press. You know, a lot of young people don't realize that just because you can get it on the internet doesn't mean that they can continue to do it unless you contribute <laughs> money. And in a war zone, though, the, the military is not going to let them be there. That's true. I mean, even, you know. That's true. Be in the yeah. microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. It's, it's for recording for posterity. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a question from you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you so much for um, what you shared, it's really inspiring um, to understand how uh, there were so many different tactics and, and creative methods, um, you know, from, from media to, to newspaper propaganda to using the legal space, um, sneaking on base or whatever you all figured out how to do. <laughs> and some of it's almost beyond my imagination um, growing up, you know, in the 90s up until 2022. 
um, to imagine how that could have been developed. Um, something else that I think is hard for young anti-war activists to understand is what happened uh, as the movement started declining um, and how did it fall apart, which maybe is a harder part of the history. Um, so I, I ask it respectfully, you know, to understand but I'm curious if anyone from the anti-war movement on the civilian side does have analysis as to what were some of the, the shortcomings of the movement at the time so that we can learn those lessons as well to know um, how did such a powerful struggle um, really become so um, scattered and, um, you know what I mean, like well, defanged. Uh, after part of it was time. the war ended. I mean that that and the other was the draft ended and both of those had a huge impact I think I mean I, I'm sure you all have something to contribute to that as well but it was um, the motivation went away and there was so there was a much much smaller anti-imperialist kind of general anti-war movement in the United States afterwards but it wasn't the same thing as people being asked to fight a war saying, no, thank you, no, sir, I am not going to do that. So, um, I, and I think, you know, the, the, the fact that we now have what is essentially a poverty draft um, is also really important to understand. It's kind of like the flip side of student debt. Right. Yep. Um, you know, you, if, you, if you go into the military, you get a pathetic version of the GI Bill, but you at least get something. Um, and so there's, there's a sort of economic incentive now that um, didn't register back then because, I mean, I went to law school for $500 a semester, right? <laughs> Just saying. I like to torture young people with that fact. <laughs> because you guys should so be having a revolution on that fact alone. And that would build an anti-war movement. <laughs> Yeah, there were a lot of those factors. There's also no mass movement can just go there and stay up there forever. Um, and that's why I talked about, um, you know, feeling that we need to go beyond the, the first round issues that, that work us up to seeing the larger picture and working for all the other movements out there and you know I mean we're not going to get rid of imperialism until we get rid of capitalism we all know that right <laughs> um, and I've got to say I don't know I don't think it was so much in the GI movement that's why I think the GI movement was so much more advanced than the civilian movement but a lot of the civilian movement and some of it was led by people like the Socialist Workers Party, whose whole thing was lowest common denominator. The only way you can get people out in the streets is out now and never go beyond that. Well, the people in the, in the crowds were way beyond that. You know, they were saying victory to the Vietnamese. You know, they were saying revolution now. They were saying black power and all power to the people. But you couldn't hear that on the podium because that was verboten. And we just have to get on beyond that. That's number one. And number two is, okay, you know, my group has a position that you don't like on something. Fine, let's figure out what we agree on and get out there together fighting because that right wing is coming after yeah. our asses, all of us. <laughs> Your question is so important. Raleigh, did you want to weigh in on that too? Just, uh, yeah, I'll be really short. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it, it, we, it, it didn't actually, I mean, it, it changed. It Vol answer. Volunteer Army came in and we changed. The draftees stopped coming in, GI started coming back, Air Force started getting, and, and if you look at the activity, our activity moved to Subic Bay and to, and to uh, Okinawa. We, 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 we did respond. The volunteer army 
uh, changed a number of things that weren't the critical things that made people angry. I mean, it had a smaller barracks, uh, eight, eight people in a room. It had, they told their drill sergeants that they couldn't beat the, the people anymore, uh, uh, you know, physically. And, and it was like, we, it, was a, it was, you know, it was response. We, we were responding. Um, the, war, the war ended, and for some people it ended sooner than 75. And they thought, oh, well, the draftees are back. I mean, it's, it's screw it. And uh, so, um, talk about Bud Apple. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, and, and, uh, we were we were doing a lot more than um, than we were a lot do, doing a lot more than saying this is against the war. In 1971, there was a huge lettuce strike, the Bud Apple strike in Salinas. It was a huge corporation. The farm workers took it on a, in a big way, and then almost lost control of their own workers when the workers became pretty violent. There was a huge back and forth going on. We invited Bud Anto workers, we went to their union meetings, uh, PCS people, civilians, and said, we can get you on base. Tell the soldiers, because the army started buying lettuce where there was never salads. There were 25 kinds of salads, and they were throwing it all away. But we went and we got, um, at one point, because of the National Lawyers Guild, we had got 14 UFW workers onto the base, hid them, and waited for noon where the workers came out to the mess hall. They all popped out, pulled their coats open, and they had posters that said, I, I don't speak English, but I speak the language of the oppressed. Help us win the fight. And, oh, wow. and, and so we were, and they were passing out leaflets, and the EMPs went batshit crazy. They didn't know what, suddenly, like 14 different places were being invaded by the communists. <laughs> we did things, we, and we connected, and the workers, and the workers and the soldiers understood, you know, why they were both there. so much for the question. Uh, I want to be very equitable, so let's take Alan and then the, question, the gentleman behind you. Last weekend there was a uh, march in Seattle regarding the, uh, last weekend there was a march in uh, Seattle regarding the birth of, uh, of the Iranian women and a, a national, it was probably international, no, no. international protest. Uh, this Saturday there's going to be another women's march in the United States, it might be international too. So, what do you think? There is the same potential of, of this new rising to be like the anti-war marches or movement, women see, or people seeking equal rights. <laughs> there or here? Um, uh, <laughs> I, okay, my, my smart-ass answer was no. Um, I, I would temper that since we're being recorded, but... Um, <laughs> um, I, in terms of support for the women in Iran, no. I don't think that there is an opportunity to build a mass movement in the United States in support of something other. I think the difference with Vietnam was we were sending people there to do harm. We are not the enemy in the, in the Iranian women's fight right now. I could go back with you. I'm sure we could all go back to the, you know, Shah and the, I mean, we could tell the story about how we are complicit in that. But that's a little too obscure, I think, to, to be the source of any mass mobilization. Yeah. Seattle and Portland, maybe, but. Come in the blue shirt. Well, I think she if I could just say quickly, uh, uh, that said, the feminist movement has been going international now for uh, 10, 15 years, and there, there is a lot of support for the Iranian women out of that, a lot of recognition that women in Latin America have been just kicking ass, <laughs> and hopefully that's going to help the fight for abortion rights here, which is part of the overall picture. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wanted to ask the panelists what they thought of the, the different context um, of anti-war movement then and now. Back uh, when Vietnam started, uh, my reflection is that most people trusted the U.S. government, and they thought if the U.S. government was doing it, it was probably a good thing, at least at the very beginning. And that's why the teaching movement started, to educate the officials as to what they thought was really going on, so that they would understand that they were making a mistake by being there. Now, it seems like after the anti-Vietnam War movement and so many other things that have happened since then, um, 
most people are no or most people are, are cynical about the, the U.S. government yeah. and what it does around the world. But even if they don't directly oppose it, they're at least very cynical about it, uh, and they're not expecting the government to do the right thing. So, yeah. what is? How does that shift? Do you think? change the way we organize now or how what kind of impact we can make now? Hmm, that's a good question. Great question. Okay. <laughs> you want to start? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't actually have a direct answer, but I, I, for the young people here, uh, the, and talking about the military, <coughs> the situation's changed uh, in, in the way you're described, but also the military's changed. And there, there are cracks, there are openings, and if you look at, like, um, I've been doing research on Travis Air Force Base, the other base, McCord, or base, whatever it's called, base, whatever it's, uh, these are the two main logistical centers of all war in the future Pacific. And on these bases are things like clubs that the, the uh, folks who are uh, in the military are in, and there's like an atheist club. There's a Latino history club. There's openings. We need to look for them. And in terms of education, we need to, again, uh, find, find cracks and get in there and push. And I, and I don't, that's not an answer to your question, but it's, it's one, one thing that I think should be done. I also think that the question is a little more complicated now because we've got those who uh, don't trust the government from the left and from the right. And we need to win over some of the people who are falling for the right. <laughs> okay. No answer, but... <laughs> you were the next question. Oh, I was going to come back to the Iran question. I was listening to an interview of an Iranian woman this morning, and she said if Americans wanted to help Iranian women, they, we could lift the sanctions. Yeah. Did everybody hear it? Did everybody hear that? She, she was listening to uh, uh, what somebody in the news media press. No, a Iran. woman in Iran. A woman in Iran was being interviewed by an American, and she yeah. said the single thing that would help Iranian women the most would be to lift the sanctions. The single thing that would help Iranian women the most would be to lift would be to lift the uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran. And let us count the countries where, if we just lifted the goddamn sanctions, yeah, things right. might turn around. They could take care of business. Uh, right question from the gentleman here. Cuba. Venezuela. So, <laughs> you name it. Sorry, I don't know how long you've been continuously involved in the anti war movement. Uh, what I wanted to ask was during the, like, around the time of, like, 9 11, when there was increasing national support for the military, how did your uh, tactics change, or how did you have to engage with the public, which was being you know, jingoistic? Can I answer that from the Lawyers Guild's perspective? I think to start, uh, we fought very hard against the Patriot Act and the other very repressive legislation that was coming out of, um, after 9-11, out of the, from the Bush administration. There also was, as you might recall, a real surge in anti-war activity against the invasion in Iraq. Not so much Afghanistan, but the invasion in Iraq. I mean, I remember there were people, and it was, really telling because there were people around the world marching to stop the U.S. from going into Iraq. Around the world. I, I call it the sort of beginning of a global civil society. I mean, it, it, it was so coordinated and had something to do with internet communication that it was instant like that, but it was very powerful. And the Lawyers Guild immediately went and started organizing law students and young lawyers to get out there and start working with GIs to do the kind of counseling that was necessary. And we did some stop loss cases where they were trying, they, they, I won't go into detail, but trying to keep GIs in past their time to be uh, mustered out. And mm -hmm. so th there was a real mobilization, at least among lawyers and young law students. I, I want to say exactly right. And the other thing they did, they, they started training sessions for civilian counselors. When, when Trump, um, when it looked like the National Guard was going to be used and going to be brought into, into play, uh, the military law, uh, I can't remember what exactly the acronym is. Yep, the military law task force now. Yeah, military law task force. I, I went through a whole series of training on National Guard law. They, and they, and they was open to anybody, and the training was really good, and it was, uh, it was presupposing that, that Trump might drag the National Guard in, and if that happened, 
the VFP Seattle puts an ad in the local paper in the paper for the base saying, if this isn't what you signed up for, contact us. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have uh, one comment I want to make. But I think one of the elements, yeah, was there another question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, please, follow-up question. Yes. Uh, it was about um, lawyering. It was about in Vietnam. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, like, what kind of pressure did you face from the military establishment in Vietnam during the cases you had to prosecute there? Um, and not so much in Vietnam, quite honestly. Um, the ACLU had had some lawyers in Vietnam uh, earlier, um, and um, I, I had access to the base at Long Bin. I would go in my little motor scooter every morning and go from Saigon. I was staying in some hotel in Saigon with a bunch of U.S. Or, and foreign correspondents, and then I would just drive my little scooter out to Long Bin, and they would just wave me in, partly because they figured I was someone's Whatever, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, they couldn't imagine that I was actually a lawyer. And I, I mean, I had free access to the base. I remember walking, well, I won't go into stories, but in the Philippines, because Marcos was getting very close to declaring martial law, um, and the Navy could not wait to get rid of us. They tried any number of tactics. They tried planting drugs at our house, and then they tried deporting us. And the, it was kind of funny because they said, they were going to deport us for practicing law in the Philippines without being admitted to the Filipino bar. And we went to the press, the Filipino press, with that right away and said, excuse us, there are a lot of JAG lawyers practicing law in the Philippines without being admitted to the Filipino bar. Either these bases are Filipino, in which case we're all over it and we're leaving along with the rest of the GIs, you know, or they're, they're U.S. territory and we're not practicing law in the Philippines. So take your pick. And it, it just blew up. I mean, we were on the front page of the tabloid press in Manila. You know, so it was, I mean, it, it, the, but the Navy was after us nonstop. And, and when we left, Dan and I left, we were replaced with another couple lawyers. They were deported the minute that Marcos declared martial law. They were just sent home after being in jail for a couple days. Was there a question for the back? Well, I was just going to ask about, um, I remember coming from this older generation that one of the fights was to reduce the military budget. And it just reminded me of today's fight to reduce police budgets and invest in communities. And I just wondered if people thought, I'm just looking kind of at the younger folks, about how that could translate into taking on the military budget at the national level. A worthy battle. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just mentioned under my breath that a worthy battle. I mean, you look at all the things we are not funding in this country or to help other countries that we should be helping, and they keep going, oh, yeah, we're going to send another few billion more than the military even asked for. And the defense industry is just feeling its oats right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're sending all this equipment to Ukraine and, and making a bloody fortune, right? I mean, what it makes me think of is in the 80s with, when Reagan and Gorbachev declared the Cold War over, you might recall, um, we were all sitting around waiting for a peace dividend, right? All of a sudden, there was going to be all this money available for education and health and so on and so forth. Nada. I mean, the defense industry figured that one out within a heartbeat mm -hmm. and came up with terrorists and you know all kinds of people that we should be spending our <laughs> military budget on. But there's also, uh, we got to create public opinion. It's not just up to them. And I remember the bumper stickers. It'll be a great day when they have to hold a goddamn gr uh, bake sale <laughs> for an aircraft carrier and the money goes to the schools. Let's get our bumper stickers back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Um, I don't have a question. Uh, one more question. I just have yeah. a, I just have a push. Uh, I just wanted to remind people that there's an essay contest for students, and since we have students here, I just wanted to promote that uh, five hundred dollar prize. And um, basically, it's a response to the exhibit um, at the Allen Center. So, please ask lots of questions. <laughs>
So, uh, one uh, final comment I'll make before I turn over to the MC for our uh, afternoon uh, break is this. Uh, I think that one of the, ele uh, the elephant in the room here is there are so few young people here. There's so much uh, uh, knowledge just in here in this room from uh, folks of my generation who uh, worked so hard to put an end to a terrible war and uh, know quite a bit about organizing for, uh, for against the uh, military, uh, hyper-militarized hyper culture and what it's doing to us, how damaging it is, how expensive it is, how destructive it is. Uh, and uh, we need to find some way to communicate better. Uh, uh, the, the future the world is with the young people, and uh, we would love to uh, partner with uh, folks from a different generation. I know, you know, a lot of us are a bunch of old white guys. Uh, we don't uh, communicate the way that young people do at all. But we, we, we could all do a better job trying to find, build those bridges so we can work together against a common evil. Uh, yes. Okay, we got a statement here from a young person. Yay! <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Carly. This is Nikhil. Hi, I'm Nikhil. <laughs> um, we, well, we asked permission from the organizers of the conference to make a quick announcement about a current campaign and uh, our organizing effort. Uh, but just to open it up, we just wanted to say that um, I think we're very humbled and honored to be in this space um, because the, the efforts were truly uh, very heroic, uh, very mass in character, um, and the resistance, especially from within the, the GI movement, um, personally to me is very, very inspiring. Um, so thank you so much to all the hard work um, that went into putting on this space. Uh, and yes, good segues related to um, the transnational corporations that stand to profit from uh, these wars of aggression today. Um, and then the question of how do we communicate across generations and across um, epics and periods of our resistance movements. Um, so we just wanted to take a second to introduce ourselves and um, give an announcement about what we're, what we're aiming to do and how we hope to collaborate. First off, I'll uh, introduce our organization. We're Resist US-led War in Seattle. We're a local chapter of a global anti-war alliance called Resist US-led War. And um, we're united by two calls, which is to resist US-led war and to build just peace. Uh, real, actual peace, not economic exploitation, not neo-colonialism, actual peace. And uh, we have some handouts in the back if you want to look at our manifesto and our calls. And um, we've just formed as an organization and we're organizing here on campus uh, a campaign called Cut Ties with Boeing. Um, you touched on war production, war manufacturing, and the military budget. And we identify the military industrial complex as the, the force that is driving these perpetual wars uh, for profit. And we also understand students' power to recognize that, to expose it and oppose it, to identify the connections of, between universities that uh, are part of the war production pipeline that funnel students into these companies, like Boeing, which is the third largest weapons corporation in the world. And uh, through scholarships and fellowships and these donations and relationships, um, I, I'm really, really honored to be here and to learn from all of y'all. I, I got a chance to see the exhibit on Tuesday. I, I was completely struck by just the scale of it and the amount of connections and the, the mass character of it, uh, the relationship between GIs leading the movement and students supporting it, and hearing the stories and listening and understanding what the conditions were in this US imperialist war in Vietnam, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, I'm humbled, but I'm also really, really fired up. I'm really seeing what's possible and seeing the connections that y'all made and the rejection of the U.S. narrative, the creation of your own press, uh, the connections across movements that you were building, and I'm excited to, to take that on and to, to, to take it on together. actually building up a campaign right now. Um, we're action-oriented, we're unity-oriented, we're um, united front-oriented, so we want to work with every group possible um, as Resist US-led war. Um, our campaign call right now is University of Washington Cut Ties with Boeing. 
Um, we've been building up this campaign actually for about four years. Um, it's had different iterations. Uh, we started out doing teach-ins in 2018 um, and uh, started a campaign of propaganda online called Imperialist Watch, where we did research into the connections that Boeing has um, to the imperialist machine, um, how it profiteers from war, um, and what it looks like here at the University of Washington where this conference is being conducted. Um, so if that's not like serendipity or um, shared consciousness or something, you know, we're all here um, for a reason. So we're, um, we're building up a campaign that spans across student, community, um, professors, activists, uh, where we hope to do two things. One is um, raise consciousness and spread mass education um, about the ties that weapons transnational corporations have uh, to our universities and to youth. Um, and number two is wage uh, campaign actions to call on this university to cut ties with Boeing. Um, whether that is the new interdisciplinary engineering building that just got a $10 million donation from Boeing, whether that's the engineering department, the aerospace department, um, the DOD and uh, Boeing funded uh, research grants, um, we know that its money is here and it's controlling the education of um, the largest university in the state. Um, and so that's why we're here on campus uh, and we, uh, we have opportunities to partner. Um, so if the door is open to partner between generations, please walk through. We want to work together, um, absolutely, hands down. Like We have so much to learn and we also have a lot to offer. Um, so we have two next steps, um, if anyone is interested in partnering. One is I'm going to pass around this sign-up sheet. Um, you can check out what our manifesto says. Our two points of unity are resist U.S.-led wars and uh, fight for just peace, build just peace. Uh, so you can take a look at the front, and if you agree, you can sign on on the back. If you're a tech person, there's also a little QR code in the corner. You can use your phone, point your camera at it, and it'll take you to a website. If you click on that link on your phone, it'll take you to an online version of this. If you're not a tech person, just turn it over and write your name and your email on the back. So either way is okay with us. Um, choose one of them, though, if you want to sign on. Um, that's how you join Resist. That's how you join us. Um, number two is in the back. There's a, a couple flyers about our campaign. Um, there's also copies of our manifesto. So if you want to take those, then take a look at it. And if your organization wants to uh, support our campaign um, or, want, or finds ways that we can work together against Boeing, against war, against war profiteering, um, against imperialism, then um, please take a look at that and sign on to our interest form. We'll also be here all day, so you can also just talk to us. But uh, yes, thank you so much for the extra time, oh, and thank absolutely. you for hosting this conference. <laughs> Like I said, I'm not going to read in our enthusiastic panelists nor our speakers, especially from the younger generation. That's a vision of hope for the future, and I can't think of a better way to end the second panel.